last 12 months, there have been impressive developments uh, relating to uh, public sector open source in the EU. There is without a doubt a new momentum behind open source and government. So let me introduce already uh, on, the, on the floor, James Lovegrove of Red Hat, who is the session leader for our panel on European public sector innovation and open source. Take it away, James, and we'll get Great. other people on stage. Thank you, Astor. Whilst folks are joining, I'm going to welcome you all to the first panel discussion of OFI's annual EU Open Source Policy Summit. And we've already got off to a flying start. Uh, indeed, Commissioner Breton's strong support in his keynote today on the importance of embedding open source, quote, in the public sector to make them more efficient and more resilient provides a great entree to this panel on that very topic. So that's European public sector innovation and open source. So I'm James Lovegrove, Director for Public Policy at Red Hat, and I have the pleasure to be the session leader of this really impressive panel. So um, I'm going to just introduce briefly who they are as they join, they're joined. So um, we have, not yet Maria, but we have, yes, so we have Pia Kager, Director of the Department for Digital Society in Germany's Interior Ministry, BMI. Uh, we have Mario Compalago, Acting Director General, DG Digit at the European Commission, Francesca Bria, President of the Italian Innovation Fund, CDP, and Rafael Laguna, CEO of Germany's Agency for Disruptive Innovation, Sprint. And we will be joined later on uh, by Maria uh, de Fatima Fonseca, Portugal State Secretary for Innovation and Administrative Modernization. So I think what we'll do is slightly readjust um, as uh, Maria um, uh, tackles the uh, technical issues and, of joining um, and we will go to actually the second speaker that we have uh, in mind. Sivan is helping at once. Well done Sivan, thank you. Um, so, so I think so let's go to, to you um, Pia if I, if, I'm, if, I'm, if, I, if I may. So I'd like to introduce you to, um, to a, a, a quite significant audience of passionate open source and also those who are finding out about open source for the, for the first time. Uh, Pierre leads the Director for Digital Society in the Ministry of Interior, which has an important change role function in the context of digital sovereignty for society. So Pierre is also a member of the Federal Board of CIOs, bringing together IT leaders from all major ministries um, in Germany, defence, labour, finance, health, etc. So my question to you, Pierre, is open source has become an increasingly prominent topic in the German federal government. Can you describe why open source has garnered the attention of the highest levels of government and how you have embedded it in the strategies to take to tackle critical objectives for your ministry? Thank you, James. Thank you for the question. And of course, thank you for the invitation. It's a great honor to be here and to say a few words about our position. Well, um, open source software, of course, was on the agenda for years, but it changed during the last years. Uh, due to some, some issues, uh, we conducted uh, a strategic market analysis in uh, 2019 with a focus on software providers, especially for client software, which shows that the federal administration in Germany is heavily dependent on a very small number of IT providers. And to be honest, that was not really a surprise, but of course, um, the dependencies result in a number of pain points, some which we really see critical, for instance, when it comes to limited information security or when it comes to legal uncertainty. And in addition, the, uh, there are some recent developments which increase the pressure, pressure for digital sovereignty in Germany and within the EU, I think, for instance, uh, the increased demand for secure digital solutions during the pandemic and of course, the ruling of the European Court of Justice on the invalidity of the privacy shield. And so digital sovereignty is crucial for maintaining control over our own IT. And therefore, the federal, the state and the local governments in Germany have decided together to pursue a hybrid strategy to deal with that issues. On the one hand, we identify and develop alternative solutions, especially open source software solutions. And on the other hand, of course, we are still conducting intensive negotiations on the federal level with the main IT providers. And therefore, we prepare and enforce so-called red lines, which give clear requirements for technical providers and for their solutions. And it probably comes uh, as no surprise that due to its open standards and interfaces, open source software is one of the key building blocks of our hybrid strategy towards digital sovereignty. And with that, we see three benefits 
open source software enables interoperability and thereby strengthen the ability of the public administration to switch between components, applications and providers. It enhances our ability to shape our own independently IT, more independently as uh, before, as the code can be easily reviewed, changed and redistributed. And by promoting and using open source, um, the public administration can increase its influence on providers um, as a market power. And of course, nothing comes without challenges. In particular, we will need a strong commitment in terms of financial investment, but even more in terms of cultural uh, issues and competencies. Um, but that will, I think, lead to new opportunities by integrating innovative startups in our uh, corporations and small and medium enterprise sized enterprises and also encourage efficient cooperation across all levels of the public administration. So far, the Federal Ministry of the Interior has already launched a number of different initiatives. For instance, we consider to found a center of digital sovereignty and we conduct some open source based proof of concepts, which are all designed to promote the use of open source within the public administration. And of course, we want to identi uh, identify the European cooperation on such initiatives. For this purpose, we place the goal of the di digital sovereignty in the joint Berlin Declaration, which was uh, signed during our last presidency of the EU Council. And I'm sure Portugal will continue this focus to strengthen digital sovereignty. Great, thank you very much, Pierre. Um, I see that uh, Maria has, okay, uh, we're finding a replacement for Maria, um, but let's move on to um, not quite the Portuguese government, but a, a fine Portuguese gentleman um, who is the uh, Acting Director General of Digit, Mr. Mario Compalago. Uh, Mario's DG is responsible for providing digital services for the Commission, as well as other EU institutions, plus helping public administrations in EU member states to collaborate, share, reuse, solve public sector challenges together. So my question to you, Mario, if I may, is given DG Digit Informatics mandate, can you share your assessment of progress? And given that the, the several hundred uh, folks in the audience today, virtual audience, uh, open source colleagues, the ongoing open collaborative initiatives that you've been running, driving, leading, and what's to come in 2021? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, uh, James, and uh, hello to everybody. Uh, in fact, our president, Ursula von der Leyen, didn't give us a lot of choices because he promised to transform the commission into a digital commission, and recently she called upon uh, Europe to enter the digital decade. And what, what it is, what is it, a, a digital commission? It has to be certainly a, 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 an administration, hopefully a world-class administration that is open and trusted and secured and connected and data driven and obviously in this context the word open appears first i think that person i would claim that openness to others and to the ideas of the others is probably uh, behind the progress of humanity and for europe i think that is an important uh, an important value value and i'm referring here obviously to uh, the peer reference to the uh, uh, berlin declaration that is to look uh, to the public sector from the perspective of the european values so, so uh, 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 here in Europe, obviously, we talk very often about open government, about open administrations and open data. What is therefore the implication for an IT department like Digit that on top of that believes to be a catalyzer for the transformation of the, of the Commission? Well, means that we have to go along our own uh, set digital strategy. In 2018, we committed, obviously, to put data at the center, to uh, use hybrid infrastructures, to build uh, our uh, uh, services uh, upon reusable components that themselves are to be developed in, in open source. But I think that what really we promised was that we would adopt a digital lifestyle based on open source. And in our digital strategy, you see certainly references to the encouragement of co-creation, to the adoption of open source solutions. Uh, we, we call upon our uh, uh, and, and, and the IT community of the member states to tap into the growing potential of open source software, not just joining forces with the major commercial players, but also with the open communities to try to develop the uh, solutions that will be implementing the European policies of the future. Well, 
I must say as well that it, 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 our software development teams for a long time have been already adopting working methods that are very much influenced, if not completely based on open source principles. But we, we decided to go further and we decided to complement the digital strategy with a, a newly formulated open source software strategy to cover the period of 2020 to 2023, whose actually subtitle is Think Open. It was adopted by the College of Commissioners in October this year and widely announced. In a nutshell, this strategy will make sure that the Commission becomes even more involved in open source than in the past. That strategy has to reinforce the internal uh, working culture that is already largely based on the principles of open source, as I said. But because we are always in collaboration with member states, the Tallinn Declaration, more recently the Berlin Declaration, and, and I know the Berlin Declaration is on digital society and value-based digital government, very much value-based European values, digital government, a renewed way of linking government with citizens. And apart from all the aspects where they where, the, where this declaration focuses on promoting fundamental rights, uh, democratic values, etc., uh, there is one particular aspect that focuses on digital sovereignty and interoperability. And there we see very easily common standards, modular architectures, and the use of open source uh, uh, software in the public sector as facilitators and therefore a big encouragement. And yes, I think that we can see you colleagues in Red Hat and others see also that uh, uh, the public services throughout the European Union are actually more and more using open source. How can we find ways of supporting these open source communities? Well, first, uh, the open, the uh, ISIS Square program is an excellent example. In, in the track of sharing and reuse, we promote a lot of uh, a, a lot of solutions that are open source the European interoperability framework that is so fundamental for the interoperability between public services is very much based on uh, on open source and if we don't have this interoperability framework we will not be able to implement in the future principles like the one solely principle that are at the core of the uh, of the uh, of the, the delivery of uh, pan-european services so we have done this in the context of the ISIS Square program. We will do this in the context of the Digital Europe program just announced, where we actually will broaden the support of public administrations, not just regarding interoperability, but also in the data spaces, in the use of emerging new technologies like AI or data analytics. We also look not just to the top level public administration, but at the level of regions and city level. And, and here, I think that I would like to mention that Chris uh, just in uh, in the previous uh, presentation referred to the Fiber Foundation that is developing solutions for smart cities and other areas, very much at, at the beginning supported by the European Com Commission research programs. So this is very important. And why? Because Europe decided on a recovery and resilience, resilience package that is huge. And 20% of the next generation EU, 20% of the 1.8 trillion uh, that is allocated to the member states has to be allocated for digital so huge opportunities but more than using uh, if you allow me still a, a minute more than just using open source i think that the commission wanted through its strategy to be able to contribute to the developer communities uh, we, we have been always uh, always a contributor to the free and open software uh, source software see for example uh, the work that we are doing in terms of drupal and how much we have com uh, contributed to this uh, with our competence center to to this community but what we want with the new strategy is actually to uh, remove the legal barriers to make sure that we can not just use but share our software and allow our developers to contribute to these communities uh, we, uh, some of the software that we are develop, uh, developing through the ISA program or through the building blocks uh, like the U-Survey or the uh, uh, e Tax, or, or if I want uh, to mention something very important, the LEOS program that is focused on the legislative domain and the production of legal text, so important for us. Well, this is an interesting case because the development is actually initiated in the Commission ranks, but today, it transformed into a co-creation process where the public administrations in Spain and Germany are actually contributing. And we hope that in the future, more member states can join forces. So all in all, uh, James and colleagues, this new strategy uh, you know, makes more uh, and more an encouragement for the use of open source. Uh, we will 
host open source labs in such a way that we can experiment and we can have a relation that is not just with the big organization but also with the startups and almost the individuals that are active in the uh, open source communities we have also created the, an ospo and there will be a session uh, later on yeah. and we are interacting with ospos in the member states and also at the united nations level so all of that is fantastic things uh, that we are doing and i think that we will encourage more in the future uh, one more second if you allow me just to refer that we have been working very much through the force initiatives in creating hackathons to make sure that we would identify security vulnerabilities in open source solutions that were that were used by the commission what we want to do in the future is not just to concentrate on the uh, open source solution used by the commission but used by other public administrations as it is for example the case of metrics that is very much used in france and germany and used by all of you in events like FOSDEM. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mario. You mentioned 20% uh, of 1.8 trillion. I think that moves us very neatly onto uh, our next speaker, Mrs. Greer, who's the president of the CDP, which is Italy's promotional institution financing public investments. Uh, Francesca has also several advisory uh, and academic roles, including honorary professorship at UCL, as well as advisor to the EUN and the EU on innovation. So, so Italy, Francesca, very much in the news these days. Um, in your role as effectively a public investment bank, how is the Italian Innovation Fund leveraging public-private partnership within the open source community? And indeed, how will billions of euros of EU recovery funds, to Mario's point, fund use of such technologies to develop a true and open democracy? Again, a point that was made by Pierre early in terms of digital sovereignty and independence. Thank you. Thank you very much, James, and it is an absolute pleasure to be in this panel, in particular with uh, such great speakers like Pia, Mario and Rafael, which are also leaders driving forward this kind of transformation in Europe. Uh, so I really think that uh, Europe has now, in a post-pandemic times, but in particular with the EU Next Generation uh, Framework Program, an opportunity to build a 21st century um, digital economy uh, that um, also put forward a European digital industrial policy. Uh, because obviously it becomes very clear now for Europe that we cannot not only be a, this digital uh, EU digital um, regulatory superpower, but we also have to compete on technological innovation globally but we can do it on our own terms, which means putting forward our own model for digital sovereignty. And during the pandemic, we saw very clearly, as it was said before, that digital infrastructures, connectivity, data, AI, and so on, but also platforms became critical infrastructure underpinning services such as healthcare, education, um, mobility, uh, smart working, so critical uh, services, which because we can speed up digitalization. We have 400 billion, more or less, that are gonna be invested in sustainable digitization through the Next Generation EU uh, program, but also through the Digital um, Euro program and Horizon Europe and so on. Uh, so this is a great opportunity, but we also saw we are very much dependent and reliant on uh, the big tech platforms uh, that are mainly U US or China based. So this is where I think the technological sovereignty of Europe become uh, very important. And we have the courage to see uh, our model. We cannot copy the US or China innovation with you know, these massive high tech rent extractors and manipulators of data. We need our own model. And I think the EU regulation is moving in the right direction, focusing on open source technology markets, on data portability and data sharing, standards and protocols and restraining also gatekeepers with antitrust and competition policies. But I think, uh, as this is now my role, uh, exactly as you said, as president of the Italian Innovation Fund, and Rafael has a similar role in Germany, so we'll talk about that. EU should also make it easier for tech innovators to scale up at pan-European and global level. And European digital champions 
uh, which I think open source and open source ecosystem and open source industry is going to be critical to do that. Because of course, on one side, we need uh, the missing capital. So we need not only these large scale public investments that are going to go in critical infrastructures to take back all connectivity, data, software, microprocessors and 5G, but we also need a EU wide market in risk taking equity and venture capital. At the moment, there is also the European Innovation Council that has set up a EU venture capital fund. So, of course, the uh, Italian National Innovation Fund, 1.5 1. billion uh, euros fund, will work together with the, in, with the European Innovation Council to boost this kind of ecosystem. And, of course, we need a fully functioning single market and fund EU regulatory regimes because this is what um, that makes solutions uh, scalable. So I think we also need an organizational breakthrough in order to make innovation possible. So I hope that this kind of organization, like the, um, uh, the organization for this, the Foundation for Disruptive Innovation in Germany, uh, the France, the Italian National Innovation Fund, together with the European Innovation Council, will work more and more together. Uh, to boost this ecosystem in Europe. Let me say that I think that also open source is key to boost demand for native tech products, which are suited to European conditions and preferences through standard setting. So open standard setting, of course, uh, also subsidies and public procurement. So this was said um, in the conversation very much before. Uh, I think that privacy friendly standards open source data sovereignty because public procurement contract. I've done that when I was a city of Barcelona, where we shifted 70% of IT budget to open source technology, privacy ethics and security by design, interoperability, and, uh, and, and, and open standards. So this is possible to do through public procurement. And also the EU in this way can lower the barrier through entry because we need to get on board this small and medium sized entrepreneur, the startups, the small businesses, the developer communities, which are absolutely driving this ecosystem because otherwise, you know, this vendor lock in and the money will flow into the giant companies, into the cons the big consultancies and we miss the opportunity for a genuine uh, development, economic development policy, because, you know, 80% of our economy is actually SMEs and startups. So we need to foster that ecosystem and we can do that also through public investment and public procurement, building technology that has fundamental rights at its core and that foster collaboration, transparency, and democracy. Let me just say also that what the commissioner said that opens at the, at the beginning of this conference, that open source, transparency, and accountability is going to be key for the AI, artificial intelligence world, because we are going to, uh, you know, we want uh, accountability of algorithms. We want to make sure that there is ethics and security and privacy by design, also in the way that automated decision uh, systems are run throughout society. So this is a particularly important point. And I think that we can also foster, as Mario Campolargo's team is doing, public options for open source application platforms and technology can, can, that can effectively create marketplaces across Europe in smart city services, in healthcare, in citizens' participation. Also, this is one point I've, we have developed in Barcelona, a large scale open source platform for citizen engagement is called DCD in Barcelona. Now the commission is going to use this technology, scaling it up from a community and city level at the European level to engage citizens and in participating to build the European Green Deal and the next generation EU policies. Mm -hmm. This is a great example on how you know, you can reuse, scale, uh, audit the software and, 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 and learn from each other. And these solutions at the local scale can become pan-European and can grow. So I think this shows that you, we can have pressing, leadership also in building. You, yeah. You're clearly right pressing the right buttons. The chat function yeah. is going wild with lots yeah. of uh, thumbs up and claps for you. So uh, 
you have a lot of support in the in the chat function yeah, of this I, uh, for this conference. Cool. But if, I, if, if I could just um, now that I see um, Maria has has joined us, so well done, Maria, to back your way through um, the, sort of the technical uh, uh, challenges. Um, it's really wonderful to to have you um, join us, um, and actually, it's perfect timing. So uh, we we. we before I go into perhaps asking you a question, um, just perhaps a little bit of your uh, bit of perspective on, on who you are. Um, so you're the Secretary of State for Innovation and Administrative Modernization. Um, you're a long-standing public servant at municipal, city, and now government level in Portugal. Um, if I say an impressive track record in restructuring and modernization in the public sector. Co-author of books, articles, tackling the requisite governance, innovation, and technologies needed to drive that kind of modernization. So. Um, it, it's still very right to you about if you could elaborate a little bit more about how Portugal uh, transformation and how that's relevant for the broader EU recovery it fits in very nicely with what Francesco has just been, been mentioning about the power of the public sector as a kind of demand tool. Um, and like course, Rafael, after you, we, we can, can go to that kind of um, disruptive cyclical side um, that, uh, that uh, um, we'd like to hear more about. Uh, and also in what ways do, given your expertise, Maria, uh, with regards to sort of the governance and cultural sides of innovation, um, how do you see open source in, uh, in Commissioner Breton's words, actually making the public sector more efficient and resilient? So uh, the floor is yours, Maria, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I'm a little bit late and I'm very sorry to have missed the first interventions. Uh, good morning to all my session colleagues. How are you? Francesca, Mario, Pia and Rafael. Um, I hope uh, I can learn a lot from you uh, because uh, we share all the same perspectives, I believe. We're in purpose and I, I, I just like to highlight uh, our vision, our Portuguese vision, our common vision, actually, on uh, the cultural, cultural and organizational aspects of the deep transformation of uh, public sector that has uh, been going on for a few years now. Um, very, very simple things. Uh, I think even before this pandemic crisis, uh, most governments uh, all over the world were realizing that it takes a comprehensive and more digital approach to accomplish uh, all our missions. So uh, the pandemic just uh, highlighted the potential uh, of the digital transformation to provide better services and also to be able to deliver more integrated policies. And this is very uh, relevant. Uh, in Portugal, we have a couple of st strategy uh, documents which uh, uh, give us a clear view of um, a strategic roadmap to transform public services. And the innovation strategy is built around four great building blocks. The first is investing in people. So uh, we can empower people by developing uh, their uh, skills. Uh, and I'm speaking about, I'm talking about the skills of public workers uh, to begin with. The second one is to develop management through uh, principles of simplification and innovation and collaborative work so that data and knowledge across all the functional silos that we uh, already know uh, uh, that exists. The third pillar is to explore the technology, of course. Uh, we are ensuring global uh, technology uh, governance, improving interoperability and service uh, integration, and managing uh, the data ecosystem safely and transparently. And these keywords, everyone each and every one of us, I'm sure, will repeat a lot during the discussion. Uh, we want to manage the data uh, ecosystem, as I said, safely and transparently, promoting the reuse of data to make better and faster decisions and to provide new, seamless and digital services, uh, as well as more open and high value data sets. So the fourth to do this, the fourth and final, final pillar is proximity, because we believe that to perform better and to achieve better results, uh, we need to include all the people at all government levels in the decision-making process. So naturally, with this vision, 
the Portuguese Recovery and Resilience Plan, uh, and also the Portuguese priorities for the presidency of the Council, uh, show uh, this uh, clear vision around this transformational purpose. Um, well, to achieve these goals, uh, I must say that we are deeply committed to collaboration as a key driver to innovation and all sorts of collaboration. Collaboration with citizens and businesses, of course, uh, but also collaboration between public sector organization and, of course, uh, collaboration among our countries so that we can tackle the challenge that Mario always speaks about uh, to provide better and seamless services across uh, borders. And this is a huge commitment uh, from from Portugal, and why am I stressing this? And I'll uh, I'll just finish after the, after saying this, uh, because when we talk about open, we are necessarily talking about a collaboration, all the sorts of collaboration, and the choices, the political and organizational choices to foster collaboration, and this is the role of public policy. And I'm not uh, a technology person. I'm a public uh, policy uh, thinker and uh, a public policy maker. So this is my main concern, the role of public policy to set the scene in which we make collective choices and to organize the debate, to make clear what are the values that we are choosing from and to take action aligning all the necessary uh, partners. So. I'm hoping to learn a lot uh, in this uh, session and quite curious to hear about um, your perspective on how open can stimulate this uh, national data ecosystem with open data and privacy assurance and digital identity, all um, domains uh, in which we intend to drive a big transformation. So, um, there are uh, a little bit of game changers that uh, have been arising uh, in the few uh, in this last decade, mainly in this, this last decade. Uh, we know about open software uh, for a long time. We use uh, um, open source operating systems and open source uh, software, all sorts of open source mm -hmm. software, perhaps not uh, enough but we are committed to drive this transformation also. But the, the, um, one of the game changers, uh, I think, is data science and art artificial intelligence. So um, what does it mean to be open when it comes to software uh, systems that are heavily based on AI, for instance? This is something we are still asking ourselves, and we hope to learn uh, with you also uh, about this. So, as I said before, with the support of this European Recovery and Resilience uh, Facility, we are ex expecting to develop uh, a new ecosystem of digital services with interoperability in the back, being user-friendly in the front, and being more intelligent, I think, all over the place. So, uh, open will uh, have to be uh, a big principle that we uh, uh, must foster and drive uh, with the meaning that perhaps we have to revisit and uh, reinforce. Thank you. That was eye-opening, um, uh, inspirational as well. Uh, there's a lot to do and we need to do it uh, together. Um, what I'd like to do is move to our final speaker and actually come back to you, um, Maria, if we have time um, on one, one of the points you mentioned. So our final speaker is Rafael uh, Laguna. CEO of the German Agency for Disruptive Innovation, Sprint. Um, knows a lot about this transform transformative power, a longtime advocate, campaigner for open source, entrepreneur, founder, um, and now at Sprint looking for ways to catch up, um, but also leapfrog with open. So, Rafael, maybe you can tell us a bit more about the sort of power of open source to leapfrog and where are we in that curve and what are the kind of levers to pull? Um, and is the funding enough or, and or sufficiently focused? Over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, James. Uh, obviously, open source is the European way for everything digital. Uh, you know, technology has phases. I like to refer to and compare it to like cars, for example. And when they were invented, they were very dirty. They didn't care much about what they did to the environment. They were very expensive, but they did something that people wanted. So the cars were successful. So every technology has this dirty early phase. And then you get into a phase of optimization. People make them better 
but still they're stinkers. <laughs> they just go faster and things like that. And then some disruption happens and then hopefully the technology will become clean. I think the same is going on in everything digital. I think we are in a very dirty phase of digital products. And you see that, you know, with the data leakage that we've got, you see that with what social media has done uh, to democracies. Uh, and, and I think, um, in a way, two things come together, which are very favorable for Europe. Uh, one is that obviously we need this disruption in this uh, clean phase of digital products, which resonate very well with our values and also what drives, uh, you know, the public sector, uh, which is or was invented, uh, you know, when we invented things like science, which helped us to find a process of how to find truth and how to define them, um, which was based on openness. You know, science is based on sharing on open data, on sharing the tools and showing it to the world for everybody to repeat and build on top of what was found during the process. So that is at the core of our values, our constitutions. Our, this is what created our democracies. And now taking these values into our digital products will carry our culture forward. If we don't, our culture probably will die because it's not embedded into those products. Maria mentioned AI, you know, AI is based on data that we provide. So all the bias that's in our data will also be in the artificial intelligences that we produce. So they must be very transparent in what they do so that we can you know, use the tools of democracy that we've created for us people also in our digital products. But it's also an economical benefit. This, this sort of made in Europe 2.0 for digital products, I think will be well received in the world. It's not just Europeans that like these values, it's everybody in the world. Everybody, once they get time to think about these things, once the basic needs are taken care of, you want that type of freedom and you want that type of control over your own fate. So actually I think digital products based on European values made in Europe uh, will be very well received in the world. Now, in a way, a sign that Francesca and I got the business of launching the, the innovation agencies in our countries as open source people is kind of a sign. This cannot be an accident, right? So I take, I take that uh, very seriously because obviously there are lots of innovations that may not have to do too much with open source, but there are very few innovations that have nothing to do with any something digital in the process. And that part should be open source. Now, public sector should, of course, lead. We're spending public money. And if we're spending public money, right, we should create public code that everybody can use. But also it's a very practical means, by the way, of creating such tools. In Germany, we have tens of thousands of applications that implement the government processes you know, on the local sector, on the state sector, on the, on the, on the federal level. Um, now with lots and lots and lots of duplication. Of course, open source and the way we develop software and the way we collaborate you know, is also a way to have less duplication and to put more effort into one core. So instead of having tens of thousands, let's have a few hundred because we don't have that, more, that much more processes. We're just duplicating all the time make them available to everyone. And by the way, one uh, project in PS department is to create this central collaboration point for German government IT, uh, sort of a, a government GitHub, if you like, right? Of course, you don't want that on the real GitHub. You want your own, you want control over that and you want to expose what's there, right? To, to, to evolve that. But there's also a lot of disruptive potential. You know, you've heard of Gaia-X. Um, my agency funded one of the sub projects called Sovereign Cloud Stack, uh, which is, building an infrastructure and platform stack based, uh, you know, made out of the open source tools that we all know to, to create something that everybody can easily use to fire up infrastructure and platform services. You know, because if the foundation of our house is not open, our house won't be, right? You cannot build this on Azure or AWS or anything like that. So actual government money is also flowing into efforts to create sort of the central tools that everybody needs. And we need much more of this. I mean, there's lots of people here that have spent their lives, you know, building open office tools or uh, collaboration tools and what have you. I think we should do much, much more with government money to fund these things. And I will do a lot with my agency and I'm sure Frances Francesca will as well, so that finally these things are well-funded and uh, have a good foundation for themselves to build this sort of open, uh, federated and permissionless free Europe infrastructure and ecosystem that we all want to see, I guess. Thank you, Rafael. And I think Francesca made an interesting point around the European Innovation Council mm -hmm. and the extent to which these various agencies are collaborating in an open way and how to then find those synergies. 
Um, I think that's very compelling. And then the regulatory reference of public government pulling through technology is also very important. Um, you know, there's the March uh, Council coming up. Why not have some kind of reference in there uh, which, which makes that happen? Time is, is not on our side, I'm afraid. Um, so I, I'm, I'm conscious of time. Um, I'm, I'm fearing that uh, Asta is going to be looming into uh, sight very soon. But, but I will ask one more question, two more questions. One uh, from the chat. Um, Raphael, what, what's on your shirt? Apparently, so lots of people want to know. <laughs> You're not going to get this song out of your head all day, I promise. Schwunginnovation <laughs> <laughs> is disruptive innovation. That's cool. a German term. You know, we Germans like to make these long words, right? <laughs> this, this disruptive, disruptive is not really what they are. You know, you, you're leapfrogging stuff, right? This is why we decided to put the German word on here to make it international. But, but oh, I just just had one, on, the, on the gender gap, on the gender gap, which I think it's a, it's an important point to make, yeah. Because here, three women leading innovation in Europe, I think it's going to be, I mean, we have a commissioner also leading innovation in Europe as a woman. I mean, we need to be more and more aware that we need uh, to not only democratize, but put uh, women at the very core of this. Uh, that's that's uh, why we use your saying something very true. Innovation in Europe, yeah. exactly. <laughs> that was a very, very good point. Uh, and it's something which, again, because of the, the timing, and as I was mentioned earlier, you know, we're just touching the, 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 sort of the, the tip, as it were, of all these issues, which are absolutely vital to properly tease apart and understand and then get right. So there he is. He's loomed into sight. But I would just ask one final closing question um, to, to Maria and to, to Pierre, if, that, if I'm allowed. Um, given that there was reference to um, the uh, Berlin Declaration, which, which was signed off, uh, when was it, uh, December, and then the upcoming um, uh, Lisbon Declaration, just be interested, maybe a sentence, a few words from both of you on the extent to which they are going to be reflecting and further enhancing uh, what we all take for granted, I think, on this on this uh, this summit, uh, at least most of us, um, but reflecting that more into these kinds of guidance materials and, and creating the additional comfort that, that the, and with the extent to the, the power of, of open source. So um, Maria, Pia, maybe Maria, you, you can go, uh, maybe Pia go first and then Maria to close, maybe that's the way of going, Pia. Okay. okay, thank you. I, I try to be short. Uh, so we, we did this Berlin Declaration, which is called a value-based declaration on digital government and not on technology aspects. And that's the main focus we put on the subject. And I think that's the main focus why we should use the open principles, open standards, open source, open values, or what, whatever you want to, to call it. And uh, I would like to address that. You have the final word, then back to Astor. Okay, just building on what Pia just said. Uh, well, I, I can't unveil much about uh, the Lisbon Declaration. Uh, this declaration is being, is being prepared by my colleague from Digital Transition, Andre Azvedu. He will have the chance shortly to share a little bit of more uh, of detail uh, on the declaration. But I'd like to, to take... Um, to highlight uh, what Pia just said and um, to say just this, uh, I think there is a lot of consensus uh, on the principles that are uh, evident uh, in, the, in, the Lisbon, in the Berlin Declaration. There's a lot of consensus. So I think the next step will be to take action to pursue uh, these uh, these principles and um, uh, we must agree uh, that uh, common values are uh, central and the open uh, uh, issue is uh, fundamental and uh, why is open so important open isn't just about technology um, open goals of transparency and trust are all over our societies are really a building block of our societies uh, uh, for uh, trust in automated systems we need open and auditable uh, software and uh, algorithms but for trust in administration we also need open data and processes and for trust in democracy we will need more open participation uh, from uh, our citizens. So we all want the same things. We all share the same values. I think what we need is to be more focused on 
uh, action, an action that will express the real uh, uh, meaning uh, of these uh, values in our daily uh, practice. So, what are um, some of the aspects uh, of the Lisbon uh, Declaration? And I can say this with no, it's no <laughs> state, state secret. Uh, I think uh, we need to invest uh, in providing full uh, digital literacy uh, to our citizens. And this doesn't mean only to know how to use technology, but to understand uh, how far we want to go using technology. And on the other hand, shared ethical values um, and their legal framework uh, as a common guide uh, for uh, at least government practitioners and all, also uh, uh, digital developers. So uh, these are some of the building blocks of the Lisbon Declaration. Because Thank you ethics as real value not only economic value but social value and we must never forget this thank you thank you very much and i think closing on that that point as you say it's open ensures that i think you put it uh, much more articulately than i have it's that that open ensures that public value is built on values of the citizen i think that's a a very very powerful um way of looking at it so please it's, uh, accept our apologies, we're slightly running late, and thank you all um, on the panel for a fantastic um, insight on, on open, open source uh, public sector in Europe and, and, uh, and what we can expect in 2021. So big, big thank you, and back to you, Astor.